lesson two, set free to follow. Long before I brought Lass home to stay with us, I had painstakingly prepared a new kennel for the special dog that would share our life at Fairwinds. In my mind's eye, I had pictured a border collie that would work with me on the ranch, share in the care of the sheep, and become a virtual member of our family. There was a new leash as well. There were also clean dishes to hold fresh food and water. Everything was in readiness for the dog chosen to be my companion and co-worker. There was so much at stake in this selection. The successful operation of the ranch depended on a good dog. The skillful handling of the sheep was bound up in the creature's capacity to work obediently. My own contentment in managing the flock rested in her responsiveness to my commands. All of these hopes, dreams, and aspirations moved through my mind as I drove home with Lass in the car. At last, we pulled up at our gate. Gently, I opened it, then drove to our rustic cottage perched on a rise of ground overlooking the sea. Here in our country setting, all was tranquil. Only the wind in the trees, the tide running against the rocks, the gulls and crows wheeling and crying in the breeze above the shore broke the silence. There are no boys racing on bicycles, no cars roaring up the road, no traffic din or city noises to distract and disturb. Lass was coming into a new setting of quiet serenity. She was entering the life of a brand new master. What would she do? Her initial reaction was to slink away, crouched low in the grass in commingled fear and foreboding. Had she not been on a long leash, she would have fled into the nearby forest behind our home. Speaking to her softly, gent gently, uh, petting her gently, I led her to the kennel standing in the shade by a lovely oak. She simply stared at it, refusing to enter. Instead, she stubbornly crouched at the entrance, staring at me with defiant eyes. My wife, my wife, thrilled and excited by the beautiful dog, brought out a heaping bowl of food. I fetched another dish full of water for her. She ignored both of our offerings. She refused to touch either the food or drink. This went on day after day. I was utterly dismayed. There was no sign of positive response. Her form became gout and wasted as day followed day. In a bold and desperate act, I, I undid her leash and set her free. In a flash, she was gone, feeling like a fleeing phantom, she vanished into the woods. I wondered if ever I would see her again. I drove up and down our country road in hope of finding her. I called at neighboring ranches. I combed our fields and ocean edge, but no sign of lass. In the anguish of my search, I began to understand a little of the sorrow God endures amid all his endeavors to draw us to him. Again and again, we refuse his benefits offered to us. Belligerently, we rebuff his love and concern. Yet in spite of her indifference and unyielding resistance, I had an enormous empathy for the dog. I longed to redeem her. I was consumed with the desire to make her into a loving, loyal companion. I yearned to see her rise to the potential that lay dormant within her. All of these hopes seemed dashed into dust until one evening I looked up onto the edge of a rough rock outcrop behind the cottage. There she was. I decided to take food and water up to her lookout. Every morning it was gone, and yet every evening she would be back. Every time I approached her, called her by name, or whistled, she vanished, spirited away like smoke, whisked, whisked away in the wind. I began to wonder if this distant dog would ever become truly mine. She did not mind eating the food set out for her. She drank the water poured out for her. She released, she relished the total freedom she had been giving. But she was not mine, nor was I hers. Caught up in this standoff, the gracious Spirit of God brought home to my heart with great clarity the predicament in which people put themselves before God. The master comes to us in our plight. He offers to take us into his family. He spares no pains to provide all that is necessary for our welfare and contentment. He speaks to us reassuringly. He calls us by name. He sets us totally free. 
Yet the personal response of most people is to recoil from him. They resent his, his approach. They refuse to respond to his overtures of compassion. They flee to escape from his hands. The, the paradox in this belligerent behavior is that at the same time, they do not mind taking advantage of Christ's benefits, but at the moment and place of their own choosing and their own self-willed way. God in Christ has come and set people free. He has placed before him the benefits and delights of belonging to his family. He has made available to them his love, his care, his provisions in generous measure. In spite of this, their liberty and freedom is used for selfish ends. They insist on doing their own thing in their own way at their own time. They are not under the master's control. All the good of which they are capable comes to nothing. One night, a few ewes and lambs grazed up near the rock where Lass would lay. I saw her sit up, cock her head, and watch them with great intensity. Perhaps her latent instincts to shepherd sheep were coming alive. Each evening when the day's chores were done, I would direct a few sheep toward her, hoping this might somehow help to establish contact between us. But nothing seemed to elicit her positive response. I began to wonder if all my overtures of love were in vain. The dark prospect that she might have to be destroyed loomed even larger. This was the most poignant lesson I learned from Lance. It was she who eventually must make the decision whether or not she would come to me and trust her life to my care, allow me to control her conduct. At this point in my own walk with God, I have been bewildered by the conflicting views and highly divergent doctrines debated within Christendom. Discussions on the absolute sovereignty of God were held by the extreme Calvinists, and the grave responsibility of man as taught by the Arminians had always dismayed me. But in the final analysis, the issue always arises as to the ultimate end of man. Does he decide his own destiny? Does he determine his own destruction? Does he discover that hell or heaven are of his own choice, not God's? In my agonizing approaches and appeals to last, I saw with intense clarity that both views were correct, complementary, complementary and reconciled within the response of an individual's will. As her new master, I'd done everything I could within my power and sovereign love for her. Now she, in response to my compassion, would have to choose to come to me of her own free will, yet ever drawn by my own overtures of concern. The last thing in the world I wanted was to have this dog destroyed. Just the thought grieved me. I cringed from the very prospect of losing this lovely creature. God's word is very clear in this whole matter. He does not come to condemn us. He does not desire to destroy us. We ourselves choose what our end shall be. We are free to follow our own feeble ways, or we are free to follow him who came to deliver us from the despair of our own dilemma. It was with such truth surging through my spirit that I would go out at twilight to try and draw this irrescribable creature to myself. Steadily, my hopes grew dimmer. The crucial hour of final reckoning was just around the corner. My spirit would not always strive with last. Her prospects were fading. Then one summer evening, the sun was setting in a spectacle of golden glory over the western horizon. The mingled cover, colors of rose, lavender, gold, and scarlet were reflected in the sea. In the foreground, my flock fed peace, peacefully in the pastures at the ocean edge. It was utterly breathtaking, a scene which transported one into a wondrous serenity. But softly, almost imperceptibly, amid my reverie, I sensed the hesitant, first faint touch of a warm, soft nose touching my hands held behind my back. <clears throat> a thrill of exquisite delight swept over me. Lass had come. The distance between us had been crossed. Irrepressible joy swept through me, and wave upon wave, hope flamed anew. Clearly, I could see now why Christ told us emphatically there was tremendous joy in heaven when a, one, 
whenever a straying one came home. I could understand why all the hopes, desires, and dreams of God for his people, when brought to reality, set the angels singing. I can grasp why it is that a single soul's response to God's love, there's a reason for celestial celebration. Without being presumptuous, I felt I had stood where Christ stands and felt as he feels in that rapt moment when a wanderer comes to him at last. Last discovered to her delight that what she had found was not new chains, abuse, or bondage. What she had come home to was warmth, understanding, affection, and the thrilling freedom to fulfill the purposes for which she had been bred. All she had to do was follow me. It was I who would introduce her into a remarkable relationship of mutual trust, undivided loyalty, happy command, comradeship, and worthwhile work she had never experienced before. As I ran my hands over her wide chest, spoke to her reassuringly in tender tones, she knew at last she was where she truly belonged. She had found courage to put herself in the master's hands. And in this choice, she had found unlimited liberty, the liberty of being a loving servant and friend. It was a touching interlude that evening. It was a glorious moment in my life, never to be forgotten. In the fading twilight, she followed me home to the, co to the cottage, quietly entered her kennel, and lay down to rest in peace and contentment. The lesson is so clear. The choice is ours whether or not we can come to Christ, our Good Shepherd. For the person who does, it is to discover his boundless love, his enormous goodwill, his generous care, acceptance into his family. In all of this, there lies liberty, contentment, and total fulfillment.